Hello everyone, I'm Michael Sarabio. Across our country, politicians and Canadians from many walks of life are taking the time to remember Brian Mulroney. Canada's 18th Prime Minister, Mr. Mulroney, had a profound impact on this country, forging a free trade deal with the United States, fighting for international sanctions to end apartheid in South Africa, and though it would never come to be, negotiating the Meech Lake Accord in hopes of getting Quebec's signature on the Canadian Constitution. The tributes have been flowing since news of his death was shared Thursday evening, and on Friday, Justin Trudeau announced a state funeral will be held for the late Prime Minister. Last night and this morning, uh, Canadians have been um, awash with uh, reflections and memories and tributes uh, to former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Uh, he marked uh, the history of this country, he marked the present of this country, and uh, it is right that uh, uh, we all be reflecting on him and his family uh, today and for many days to come. I can confirm that obviously there will be a full state funeral for the former Prime Minister. Uh, we're working with the family closely to ensure that all of their uh, wishes are, uh, are respected and that it be uh, the right and fitting a tribute to him. We will uh, be sharing uh, more details, of course, uh, in coming moments. Uh, but I can also um, let everyone know that there will be opportunities for Canadians to express their uh, gratitude and share tributes uh, to the former Prime Minister as, uh, as the, uh, uh, the coming days and weeks unfold. Well, we are happy to be joined today by Joe Clark, who of course served as this country's 16th Prime Minister, also holding several prominent posts in the Mulroney government, including Secretary of State for External Affairs and Minister of Constitutional Affairs after the Meech Lake Accord. Uh, Mr. Clark, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. You know, uh, Mr. Mulroney, in the beginning, was your political rival, mm. and by the end of it, was your friend. So, so I'm wondering what you are feeling and thinking about in this moment. I should say that we began as friends, uh, and we began as friends in a time, in a quite exciting time. The country was young, we were young. Uh, Mr. Tiefenbaker, whom we both supported, had, had just won the, the prime ministership. Uh, he had done that as an optimistic Canadian, talking about the potential of the country, and Brian and I both, uh, both responded to that. And that remained, that partnership did. I, I was thinking the other day that despite the differences that we've had from time to time, when it came to choose a leader in an earlier convention, both Brian and I were, were supporters of the late Davy Fulton from British Columbia in the, in the leadership campaign. So our friendship and our association goes back uh, a long time. Uh, you don't go through two leadership campaigns without uh, fairly sharp views of circumstances. And uh, he was hurt after his loss. I was hurt after my loss. What interested me was we were able to come together I've seen some commentary suggesting it was a surprise that uh, he named me as foreign minister. I wasn't surprised. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I knew he needed me in his government. Uh, on the other hand, I knew there was an advantage to the foreign ministry because the foreign minister is out of the country a lot. <laughs> and uh, it left him with the, uh, with the freedom to establish or to, to deepen the, uh, the leadership of, of the government. We. Uh, we obviously had some disagreements on particular issues. He was respectful of different views. In fact, I think one of the characteristics that people who didn't know him might be surprised at was just how respectful he was of the views of others. At the end of the day, he knew he had to decide, and uh, he generally did that uh, uh, showing respect for, for views of others. And at critical times in my ministerial career, when uh, we had some major decisions to face. He supported me on them. Uh, he was there and uh, and made big investments in matters that I was leading. I mean, the, the investment of the government of Canada, for example, in the discussions leading to the end of apartheid mm -hmm. were quite substantial. Mm -hmm. Substantial and also essentially going against uh, big allies of Canada, including Margaret Thatcher of the United Kingdom. And indeed, the, the uh, American government was uh, had its reservations about this. And that's an important point because uh, Mulroney's relations with the heads of those governments uh, caused them to uh, 
Uh, the phrase isn't put water in their wine, but that is, is what happened. They, uh, uh, they said, all right, we're in this, we have our views, but uh, uh, he is someone we, he res we respect. And uh, that, I think, made our own progress in achieving uh, the goal we sought easier. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Mr. Mulroney, uh, as people are sharing their thoughts, yesterday and today uh, and, and into the days to come. They, what you hear time and again is how he was a, a larger than life figure. When you hear that statement, what comes to mind for you? Well, he was a larger than life figure, obviously, both in personality. He always had been a booming personality, but also in office. But the, really the important thing about him was how much he respected the views of others. Uh, a national political party uh, is made up of differences. And there are people who come from different regions, different perspectives, and they retain some of those differences and have to be persuaded. And one of the, one of the most important elements of persuasion is to recognize that your particular view is respected. And Mulroney, even if he didn't uh, respond directly, if he didn't share that particular view, he gave members of the caucus, a quite diverse caucus, a sense that they were, uh, they were being heard. And they were, it was real. Uh, his, uh, perhaps his greatest talent was as a conciliator. He was a natural conciliator. Sometimes conciliators don't get things done. He was a conciliator who used that talent to get things done. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's a lesson in that for current politicians because he, he oversaw a government where cabinet ministers really led their portfolios. It was, it seemed to have been less centralized than what we see today. And that, of course, means that the role of prime minister changes. I'm wondering if there's a lesson in that for, for today's governments. I think there's a great lesson in that. And it's not just a Canadian government lesson. It's a lesson generally about how, how uh, successful governance works. One of the great changes is the preeminence of social media now, uh, which uh, creates a necessity to respond instantly to things instantly and too often, by consequence, shallowly. Uh, we were able to, uh, we didn't have that affliction at that time, and it has changed the nature of politics. Uh, I referred to Mr. Diefenbaker, who talked about uh, uh, what the country could become. There is now a focus upon the divisions in the country, and a focus on divisions is a self-fulfilling uh, self prophecy. It can be very dangerous. We become to def define ourselves and our differences. There are always differences. Uh, Parliament is based upon differences. Uh, but the debate, uh, particularly the debate in the floor, has always been a, a relatively respectful debate. Uh, and even in times when tempers were high, I recall a point when uh, a uh, then Liberal Member of Parliament, a guy bigger than I was, was storming across with his, uh, his fist clenched. That was the exception. Now there is an atmosphere of contest that is uh, unfortunate uh, in the House and I think in the country. Mm -hmm. And it was quite contrary to uh, the, uh, the way Mulroney acted as leader. He showed uh, respect and affection for uh, leaders of other parties, and he certainly showed respect for uh, his own members of parliament and the different views they had. Well, you know, and, and, and to that point, I think some might be surprised by the number of political leaders who are stepping forward to say thank you for your advice, thank you for your mentorship. And not all of them uh, are conservatives, progressive conservatives. There are others in other political parties. And I'm sure that doesn't surprise you at all. Doesn't surprise me at all. It was his characteristic. It was one of his great successes, in fact. And it was easy to sort of... Uh, to make fun of, uh, because uh, it, uh, but uh, there was a suspicion that he wasn't sincere. He was very sincere in those conversations. And, and he was sincere. One of the marks about him was that despite all of the preoccupations of office, when something hard happened in the family of friends, uh, Brian responded, and it wasn't fake. It was uh, a genuine uh, human quality. There was, uh, uh, he was celebrated. He was attacked in public life, but he was a very strong human uh, who was able to use his human qualities to advance common interests. You say human, and I'm thinking about Mr. Mulroney's family, of course, his wife mm -hmm. and his children. And um, I, I've worked with his son, Ben, in a previous life. Uh, I, I've had the privilege to meet the other children. And what's clear is how much they love their father and how strong 
of a family the Mulroonies are. How important was that for Brian Mulroney? It was essential, but it was also quite remarkable when you consider all the uh, all the other things he had to deal with in life. And uh, it's a hard life for families. Uh, not only is the uh, the man in the family or the, the, the officer in the family absent often and away and preoccupied uh, with other things, but there are, are all sorts of unkind things said uh, that uh, can't help but sting to a son or a daughter or a, or a spouse. And they had to put up with that, and uh, they knew it was going to happen. They weren't, they weren't, uh, uh, they either grew into it or they uh, were disabused of any, uh, any uh, innocent sense uh, when, he, when he entered public life. But it was genuine with him, and he maintained that strength. And uh, it's, it, it's rare, it, one doesn't have to earn the respect of your family. It's sort of natural but it can dissipate. And in his case, he kept on earning that respect. And it was uh, reciproc, it was, uh, it was uh, returned by, uh, by them. Mm -hmm. I caught up to them, I tried to phone last night. I couldn't get through to, to Mila, but I did get a call to Caroline and she was, uh, she was naturally, uh, you know, he's, the death was not a surprise, but it was a blow. Of course. Uh, and for precisely the reasons you're talking about, the, the closeness of that family, it was, uh, it was hard on them. Mm -hmm. I think to some degree, uh, because uh, <laughs> the views of Brian Mulroney have been so diverse in the country and the criticism so common, I think the fact that so many people who did know him, people from whom you wouldn't expect support, are expressing their admiration for his approach is probably some... Uh, some balm or help to them. The challenge is more general because uh, he did not invent that style of consultative uh, leadership in the country. Uh, he made it work uh, and it's absent now and or it's declining now and uh, one hopes that a, a consideration of uh, his comportment in high office, whether the high office of party leader or the high office of prime minister, one hopes that those models will be uh, will become more evident in uh, in events in the country now. So, so a political legacy, a, a political lesson for future generations, if not this current generation. But I'm wondering, and I don't know if they are one and the same for you. How will you remember Brian Mulroney? How do you hope the country remembers Brian Mulroney? I'll remember him as someone who uh, uh, was a gifted and considerate leader. Uh, he and I had plenty of reasons to disagree on matters. Uh, we both overcame that. Uh, and uh, he was uh, uh, encouraging to me throughout, uh, throughout my time. For the country, uh, he had a sense of great possibilities for Canada. And he acted uh, to achieve them. He failed sometimes. We all fail sometimes. But that was the standard he set, and uh, we were the beneficiaries of it on climate policy, on trade policy, on our, inter our, on our legacy in international relations. Others played their role, of course. We were proud to play our role, uh, but he was the prime minister of the country, and he set a tone, uh, and he set a tone that a prime minister's office can be aloof. Uh, the office itself is alienating. It's, a, it's away from people. Uh, for most of his time as Prime Minister, he was able to break that aloofness. There were criticisms, fierce criticisms, of course. That happens when somebody takes strong positions, as he did. Uh, but I think that uh, an objective assessment of Brian Mulroney was that he was a quite extraordinary leader, both in his understanding of the nature of the country and in his capacity to cause uh, Canadians to act in respect of that nature. Joe Clark, uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts. An honor to speak with you. Thank you. As you heard from former Prime Minister Clark, Brian Mulroney died in Florida at a Palm Beach hospital where he was being treated after a fall. And as we heard from his daughter, the Ontario Treasury Board President Caroline Mulroney, Mr. Mulroney died peacefully surrounded by family. Now, naturally, there has been much discussion about how the late Prime Minister will be remembered. But back in 2018, Brian Mulroney discussed his own legacy. And here now is what he had to say in his own words. 
I'm interested in when people look back on what I did and what my government did 25 years from now, I want them to be able to say, we did the right thing for Canada. And so that's why we did the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, we did NAFTA, we did the GST, we did, that was Michael Wilson's idea. <laughs> <laughs> All the privatizations, the Canada-U.S. Uh, the Canada-U.S. Uh, Acid Rain Treaty, the Mandela stuff, which was highly controversial as well. And I knew that it would be controversial, but I, 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 I also thought, meet Schlake. Let me tell you right now that 25 years from now, people are going to be regretting dear old meet Schlake, believe me. Well, as we continue our special coverage here on CPAC, uh, we're happy to have on the program today former Prime Minister Kim Campbell. Ms. Campbell, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Now, you, of course, worked very closely with Mr. Mulroney, uh, knew him truly at a level that few Canadians did. Uh, I'm wondering how you are reacting to the news of his passing. Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm in Italy, and I woke up very early this morning and saw there were a lot of texts on my phone of people sending me the news, and I felt very sad. And when I read that, in fact, he'd been in Florida to try and recuperate from some other health issues with his heart and prostate cancer, and then had had a fall, I thought, oh, that's really unkind, <laughs> that uh, instead of getting better, he's been... Uh, uh, done in by a by a fall, which is a terrible thing that that many people uh, have a, a bad experience with that. So I felt sad that somehow or other that he that he had a few more years in him because he's been having a very interesting, productive life. But at the same time, I also felt that it was a very historical moment that this would be an opportunity for Canadians to take stock of a remarkable prime ministership and an extraordinary man. Uh, a complicated man. He made it made uh, it made enemies and friends. He had you know fans and detractors. But you don't uh, spend a lot of time leading in politics without creating both. Because the most important thing about Brian Mulroney is that he did things and uh, did big things. And uh, so he he was a larger than life person. And uh, I was very proud to be in his government. Larger than life, as you say, and, and certainly there, there is much to talk about when we reflect on Brian Mulroney. But I, I actually want to begin with your own relationship with him, because you were elected to Parliament in the 1988 vote. That was the beginning of Mr. Mulroney's second term. And I believe up until that point, you had actually not met Mr. Mulroney yet. Oh. Where, what were your impressions of him at the time? What made you think that this was a man with whom you wanted to work alongside with? Well, I was, I was nominated for the 1988 campaign after the writ had already dropped. Pat Carney was the member of Parliament for Vancouver Centre, and she had announced she wasn't running again, and they still didn't have a candidate. And she was convinced that I was the only one who could actually hold the riding for the Progressive Conservatives. And I kept saying, no, 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 no. And then finally, um, I agreed that I would resign my seat in the legislature and run. But I said to Pat, I said, I don't know Prime Minister Mulroney. Tell me about him. And she said, well, I guess I can sum him up in two ways. One, he's an Irish family man. And two, he always comes down on the right side of an issue. And I thought that was very interesting. And actually, I've never had any reason to think that she wasn't quite accurate. Because his um, his devotion to his family and uh, the importance of that to him was a really important underpinning of everything he did. Um, and he could see that the the things that you did in government affected real flesh and blood human beings. And I think he was, he you know, doted on his wonderful wife, who was an extraordinary partner for him and you know loved his kids. But I think also when it came to difficult issues, he came down on what were for me mostly the right side. And I think what was interesting about him was that he was willing to change his mind. Uh, when we think about free trade, free trade was the issue of the 1988 election. In fact, that was one of the reasons why I was interested in running, because I had realized it was going to be a very divisive campaign. And I supported the free trade agreement, uh, largely through what, you know, what I had learned in my, my time working uh, as a staffer for Premier Bill Bennett. And I thought it was important. I knew it was going to be hard. But what's interesting about Brian Mulroney is, so like many people, he had a kind of a knee-jerk view of free trade, that, you know, we couldn't have free trade with the United States because they were so much bigger. Although, actually, when you examine free trade relationships between countries of disproportionate sizes, the smaller country usually gets the biggest benefit because it gets access to a much bigger market, etc. 
So when the McDonald Royal Commission reported out in uh, 1985, and this was a commission that had been uh, struck by Pierre Trudeau and was chaired by uh, a Liberal finance minister, but it brought together some of the leading experts in the Canadian economy and polity and for a very in-depth review and study of Canada's economic life and political life. And um, uh, really a, a blue ribbon <laughs> uh, writ large uh, panel of people. And when they recommended that we should enter into negotiations for a free trade agreement with the United States, Brian Mulroney respected that uh, recommendation, certainly as something that was well-founded. And on thinking about it and learning about it, he decided that that is what he should do. But what was important was that he was willing to change his mind. He didn't take a kind of knee-jerk reaction, you know, I've always thought it couldn't happen. He was willing to learn and willing to say, there are people who've studied this issue much more deeply than I have, and they think we should do this. And you saw this in quite a number of the issues. For example, acid rain. I mean, what did Brian want me to know about acid rain? It was totally indifferent. It wasn't something that was on his, his playbook at all uh, when he came into federal politics. But one of his MPs, Stan Darling from, uh, from uh, Muskoka, uh, was very concerned about acid rain and the effect it was having on the forests of Ontario and eastern Canada and the northern eastern United States. And he just... You know, I was joking, he put his teeth in Brian Mulroney's ankle and wouldn't let go. And you have to think about this, you have to do something. And finally, Brian did. And what he found was that what Stan Darling was talking about was, in fact, absolutely true that we were, you know, experiencing very serious uh, uh, environmental damage from acid rain. And, and that, out of that came uh, the acid rain treaty which was also, in many ways, a reflection of something else that I think is important about him. And that was his understanding. Well, first of all, he was a personally very charming man, and he loved nothing more than to amuse you and uh, to tell stories and, you know, entertain people. But he also understood, uh, I think he and Mila both understood, that personal charm and personal relationships were a very important tool for building the kind of trust that you need to get people to support you. And so when you know they were meeting with other leaders and the whole thing with, with President Reagan and the Shamrock Summit and blah, 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 all of that was designed to create the kind of personal friendship that would then be good for Canada. And I remember remarking in my memoir that Brian and Mila were the first couple I'd ever met who were sort of what I would call professionally charming. <laughs> I mean, I'd worked for Bill, Bill Bennett, and he and his wife were very nice, but they didn't, they didn't see that as a particular way of enhancing the effectiveness of, of their government. Mm -hmm. And Brian and Mila did. But what was why they were so good at it was because they genuinely liked people. They were very uh, people 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 the very yeah. gregarious they enjoyed people they they had a talent meal it was wonderful i mean she could always find something interesting to say she was very real and authentic and if you talk to her she wouldn't just give you the kind of you know baffle gab she would say something real and charming and observant and and uh, interesting and as a result they built relationships of admiration and affection among many key political leaders in the world so that when brian mulrooney wanted something to happen, like an acid rain treaty with the United States, he could call Ronald Reagan, who was predisposed to do something for him, mm -hmm. that there was that friendship and that trust. So it was a very interesting mix of very good, sophisticated political calculation that used the natural skills and bonhomie and and also the desire to you know, to, to, you know, entertain people well with elegance and show Canada off, you know, at its very best. Yeah. So that was a very interesting mix. And in a, quite a number of those issues, and you've probably read the, the famous story about the, the, the close call with the free trade agreement when the Americans didn't want the, uh, the dispute resolution mechanism. And Derek Bernie calls the prime minister and says, it's going to fail because they won't accept it. And Brian calls Jim Baker, the, uh, the American, uh, I guess he was the Secretary of State then, and says, you know, um, I think I'm going to call the president. And I'm going to ask him one question. You know, why are you uh, creating a nuclear arms control agreement with your worst enemy and you won't create a free trade agreement with your best friend, Canada? And so James Baker said, I'll call you back in 30 minutes and ran off and they, and they got it. But it was all because Jim Baker knew that if Brian already called the president, the chances are he was going to get what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And it was, wasn't just because it was a good argument for Canada. It was that extra dimension of trust 
that came from building a personal relationship, mutually supporting and helping. And it was a pretty magical combination of skills. Now, a lot of people thought he was too smooth, but you know, what, what, if I could paraphrase um, uh, Barry Goldwater, you know, smoothness in the pursuit of good things for Canada is no vice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, and I, I, I'm quickly running out of time, but I do have a couple more questions for you here, because I do want to ask, when you talk about this personal investment that Brian Mulroney had in people, the fact that he did authentically like people, including members of his, uh, of his own government, his own caucus, I, I'm wondering if that type of investment ever helped you out in a tough time. Well, I wasn't that close to him, um, but there was one funny story, and I told it earlier today to someone else, that when my, my marriage broke up while I was in government, my, my husband at the time, Hardy, he did not want to be a political husband. And it, when, when Brian learned that, that Howard and I had separated, he called me at home. And, uh, and, you know, to say you know, he was concerned about this and, you know, and I guess he wondered how, you know, how, what the impact of it would be on my political career if I didn't have a husband. And then he said, do you want me to phone him? <laughs> I'm saying, no, no, no. But that was so like, it, like, you know, maybe I could phone him and talk some sense into him and whatever. You know, and the funny thing was that my, that my then husband thought that I was doing what I should be doing. He thought I was, you know, great doing what I was doing. He just didn't want to be part of it. But it was so funny that Brian, you know, his way of, of, of trying to be helpful was to, you know, to offer to be a marriage counselor. But I have to say, I declined <laughs> those particular skills. God only knows, you know, I, you know, heaven knows what would have happened if I said, yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and I, my closing question here, because of course, of course, to this day, you remain the only woman to ever hold the top office in this country. And in 1993, when you ran for the conservative leadership, a progressive conservative leadership, you, you said that Brian Mulroney had helped open the door for women in public life and public office. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand on that and, and share why you believe that at the time and perhaps still do. Well, because... You know, they traditionally, and I talked to women who served in, in the Pierre Trudeau government, whatever, you know, sometimes the prime ministers will do it on sufferance because they feel they have to. And they give you positions that they think are not going to, you know, they're going to be, you know, a lot of hard work and difficult thing, problems to solve, but they're not going to be very glamorous. Ron Mulroney, you know, uh, appointed, well, he appointed Barbara McDougall, the first woman in a finance portfolio. She was the assistant minister, the, or the, the, the junior minister of finance, but that was a big deal to put a woman in a finance portfolio. And, uh, you know, our current finance minister is the first woman ever to hold the whole thing on her own in Christopher Freeland. So it was a big deal when you think of how long ago that was. Um, but he, um, when he named me Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, you know, that was a big deal. And it was a big deal because the issues that you deal with in justice, there are a lot of gender dynamics there. And I convened a national symposium on women law and the administration of justice with his support to begin to start a conversation about ways in which women felt that the justice system didn't serve them. So not only was I, as a woman, there in that important portfolio, and seven of my predecessors had in fact gone on to be prime minister, but it put, he put me in a position where I had to actually do things for women. And although I was the first woman to be Minister of National Defense, I wasn't the first woman in a defense portfolio because Mary Collins was the Associate Minister of Defense. I didn't have an associate. She was Associate Minister to Marcel Mass, and she in introduced a whole lot of interesting programs about gender and, or the, and the, the role of women in the Canadian military and gender bias and gender discrimination and all of these things. So it wasn't just that he put women in the window to do things, but he put women in positions where they could actually advance the causes of women, where they could look deeply into some of the, the issues of public policy and public administration and the, the operation of things like the military and see whether uh, whether gender fairness was was being done there and whether there was were policy changes that needed to be made. So I think that was really very important. And I think that I remember when I became Minister of Justice going home to Vancouver and, and total strangers would come up to me on the street. They thought this was a really significant quantum leap forward for women mm -hmm. because that was a portfolio that no woman had ever held before. So when you do those things, um, you do get a chance to redefine who gets to do them. And of course, you know, there have been other women, Anne McClellan and Jody wilson Mabel, who held the, held the justice portfolio. But, um, but he, you know, because I have to tell you, there were a lot of talented men in our caucus who would have loved to have been justice minister. And he was able, he you know, took a, a chance on me 
um, you know, and, and I knew that, that, you know, it wasn't because I was the only one who, you know, who could do it. It was because, you know, he wanted to, uh, to make that change. And, um, and I think I lived up to his trust because I think I was able to do a lot of very good things and pass a lot of good legislation and difficult issues in that portfolio. But um, having his support was important, and that was a quantum leap in women establishing their ability to be effective legislators and leaders in the government of Canada. And there have been many others as well. But that was, in his government, it was important. Um, and then, of course, Barbara McDougall, who, was, who became a uh, uh, foreign minister. Uh, you know, so, you know, I mind you, Flora McDonald had been foreign minister with Bridget O'Connor, but Barbara, you know, had that portfolio. So there were a lot of ways in which women were, were front and center in the non-traditional portfolios that weren't the ones that women usually got to hold. Kim Campbell, I so appreciate the time today. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thanks. It's a very, it's an important moment to kind of rethink some of our history. So thank you for, for asking me. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Serapio, and you're watching a special edition of Primetime Politics as we remember former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Joining us right now are Robert Fife, Ottawa Bureau Chief for The Globe and Mail, political journalist and Frequent CPAC contributor Julie Van Dusen, and Joel Denis Bedevance, the Ottawa Bureau Chief for La Presse. Hello to the three of you. Hi there. Having us on. You know, a, a lot to talk about as we yeah. reflect back on the life and the career of Brian Mulroney, but, but I want to begin with, you know, that magic touch that he had. And certainly I think you, we saw that early on in his career and, and then certainly in his private life because many people aspire to actually sit in the Prime Minister's office. But here you have a man who did so, but everyone's commenting about this magic touch that he had, Bob. Yeah, he actually was a very, very charming man, both personally, but also uh, as a campaigner. I, you know, Julie and I uh, particularly uh, covered him, and you couldn't, this guy was an amazing. He would, he would, when he got in front of an audience, and by the way, in those days, there was no, uh, anybody could show up at, at rallies when he actually played to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but he'd, he'd, he'd crack jokes at the beginning, and then by the end of it, he was wound up and the whole crowd was going with him. And then when people started to heckle him, he played off the hecklers. Uh, it was just amazing to watch this guy operate. And uh, uh, so as a political campaigner, I've, I've not seen anybody as effective as Brian Maroney as an ability to campaign and get people motivated and interested in, uh, you know, cheering for him. But on a personal level, this was a man who was just enormously charming. Uh, you know, I had a I had a bad relationship with him as as when I was a reporter. Um, he didn't like a lot of the stories that I did. He called me uh, an effing uh, kneecapper. Um, so that kind of gives you an kind of gives you an idea of what he thought of me. But uh, after he left office, we kind of uh, uh, made up. And my wife, uh, uh, mother, had died. And I heard there was a phone call late in the evening, and I heard her talking on the phone. And she came out of the room she was in. She said, "That was Brian Marooney who called to wish me his condolences on my mother's death." I can't believe you were so mean to him. <laughs> <laughs> I, to the magic touch. So you touch can see how it works, right? Yeah, yeah, you exactly. can see how it works. Well, what are you talking about? Like, you, you, you too uh, covered Brian Mulroney. You, you know the stories around it. it. When you think about that, that you know, that person's person that he was, right. what do you think of? Uh, well, I covered the tail end of him, and as Bob remembers, half of my relatives were working for him. So I always <laughs> kept a bit of a... a There's many Van Duzai, but anyway. Many Van Duzai, plural. <laughs> my dad was his caucus Leon. My sister had worked uh, for him. My brother worked for Mazankowski. So um, thank God I was at the tail end of it because, um, you know, if I started yelling at him the way I did to most politicians, my father would have probably given me hell. But anyway, <laughs> so it didn't, it didn't work that way. But when I think of him, I think of a lot of different things just about um, the fact that he, he came from Bay Como, uh, from a large family, squished into the, that tiny house. He talks about it a lot, his dad being an electrician uh, and so on, and they, his mother had borders on the other side. So he said we were stacked up like cordwood. And um, because Bay Como was so isolated, he used to love to listen to the radio and listen to what was going on in the States. And uh, he passed a flyer around when he was a kid to make money. And he, he said at one point, 
I can't believe they're paying me to talk to my neighbors. <laughs> this is amazing <laughs> to go around and give flyers out and stuff like that. But on Bob's point about his personal appeal, I remember Lucien Bouchard just did an interview uh, yesterday and he said, il était fait pour la politique. He was made for politics. Mm -hmm. This guy, it just, he oozed it. Yeah. Uh, and he loved people. And, and that came from small town roots, the fact that he never forgot who he was. And, and when you're talking about your wife, uh, the fact that um, he, he called her to, uh, to a better mother dying and so on. Uh, when I left CBC, I was writing a book on, on my mom. And um, it's, I'm not trying to peddle, it's not for sale. But anyway, <laughs> <clears throat> and, he, and he heard about that. And Brian Mulroney, my mother's an artist, and he has 12 of her paintings. And he loves my mother and he loves her work. So he phoned me up and he, he wanted to be part of the book. He wanted to talk about my mother, how wonderful she was, that whole, I mean, he, she painted his four kids and she had to skulk around 24 Sussex. It was a surprise painting and she had to wait till he left and then come out of the bushes with her easel and all that <laughs> stuff. So he, he wanted to go over all that and he wanted to talk about my mom and my dad, but he took it upon himself uh, to do that because he had some kind things to say and he wanted to make sure that they were in the book. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Lovely thought, Angela uh, Denis. We uh, talk about uh, Diana as the Queen's people. I would say that Mr. Maloney was the the king of the people because he knew how to reach out to people. Uh, Bob mentioned the phone call that his uh, wife received. That's uh, and, and a number of stories like that. I've heard that so many times. He was he had human qualities that allow him to reach out over even political partisanship and reach out to people who didn't agree with them, but they were going through tough uh, times. And so he, uh, that's why he was, he remained popular within his caucus, even though like his caucus was at low of 10, 15 percent in the polls, and they would still support him, uh, you know, no matter what. And that kind of uh, politics that he did, uh, Jean Charest took it with him when he went to Quebec and, and served as a premier and provincial leader of the Liberal Party and premier. And uh, in fact, I, I was listening to Monsieur Jean Charest last night on TV and said mm -hmm. he was like a second father to me. So that's how po politics was. And then I think it's the end of an era. I don't think we're going to see politics that way. Uh, it, it, it's clearly at the end of the era, and that era of chapter will be fully closed once Jean Charest, uh, once Jean Chrétien, uh, um, you know, uh, go, goes away. Yeah, and I think, and I think we get a measure of that, right? Because the, in the, the the immediate hours after his death was announced, you had many politicians of different stripes, the prime minister included, who thanked Mulroney for for the the type of mentorship he gave, and that is regardless of of your political party, that type of nonpartisanship. I, I you know again, I don't know if that exists anymore. But you, but as much as people are expressing their admiration for the many talents, so I, I think you know. We as journalists, we also have to note the fact that he had his many troubles as well. I'm thinking about the Oliphant Commission, uh, the name of Carl Hans Schreiber. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that affect the legacy that Brian Mulroney leaves behind, do you think? Well, look, uh, we're all fa flawed human beings. Um, and he is clearly flawed, too. I mean, Mr. Mulroney uh, was a great BSer. Um, you know, he, he had to cut and divide in two sometimes the stuff he had to say to you. Um, <laughs> But, and he clearly made a very serious error in accepting money from Karl Heinz Schreiber. But at, at the same time, in the, in the 20th century, there's only been two truly transformative prime ministers. One is Pierre Elliott Trudeau with the Charter of Human Rights, Char Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and Brian Mulroney for a free trade agreement with the United States and the GST. He has created millions of jobs and lifted people out of poverty and improved the lives of this country, making us a very competitive country. He believed in the power of the free enterprise. He got, you know, he, he privatized uh, Petro-Canada and Air Canada, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, he had an enormous legacy f for this country, and it's not just that. His, one of his greatest achievements internationally was his fight for uh, apartheid. I covered him during that period of time, and despite my, all of my problems that we had to get together as a hard-hitting reporter, these were one of our proudest moments as a Canadian, to see him stand up to Margaret Thatcher and to have these black leaders from Africa uh, so admiring Maroney for being the only Western leader. Ronald Reagan was against it, Margaret Thatcher was against him, and he stood up and fought. And when Nelson Mandela got out of prison, the first place he came 
to, to was mm -hmm. to Canada. Why? He said, because Brian Mulroney stood up for me while I was in prison, and he stood up for the for the black South Africans mm -hmm. to rid the, that country of apartheid. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and and I think that's very universally noted how he was mm -hmm. fighting for sanctions, even though clear, strong, and, and close allies were against it. Uh, how, however, do you think things like the Schreiber affair affect his legacy, Julie? Well, I think it was uh, very damaging to him. Uh, there was uh, a committee inquiry on the Hill. I remember going to some of the hearings, and he was there with his wife. I'm trying to remember if he was there with his kids. His wife, yes, for sure. Uh, Caroline was there. Caroline right, Miller and there. Uh, he was clearly uh, very uncomfortable, demoralized, uh, because within all those hearings, if I recall, it did come to play that he had accepted some cash from Karl Heinz Schreiber, which was in a safe in his basement or something, 200 and some thousand dollars, and it was never 100 percent clear how did it get there? What was it for? Whatever. Uh, cash envelopes. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. what's, what's that about, right? So, if I recall, I think after that point, I think he um, hired somebody, I think it was uh, Robin Sears or whatever, as a spokesperson uh, to... From I, NDP. Uh, yes. And I think, basically, he spent a lot of time, a lot of years, uh, rehabilitating himself and I, I'm trying to remember how I mean he gave talks he gave speeches I think the years just went by uh, he got an award for being the greenest prime minister mm -hmm. I think just after a while people started saying okay that was not a good plan well, I, I talked to him about that and I, yeah. I, I said to him you know Mr. Maroney uh, that's never going to you can't whitewash this. Right. You accepted this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be in the history books. But it's not going to be the big issue in the history books. It's it's your great accomplishments right. that historians exactly. are going to look at. Yeah. Right. And, and, and he was very much concerned about his oh, legacy. Yeah. He, he talked about it quite so. often. But and, so. Yeah, if I, can, if I may say, in yeah. Quebec, I've watched, you know, the, co the coverage of Mr. Maloney's passing away, and it's barely mentioned because in Qu Quebec, he's the Carl, seen... The Carl Heinz Yeah, Carl He's yeah. seen as somebody who try to reconcile Quebec with the rest of the country, not once, but twice. He understood Quebec, and he brought nationalists, Quebec nationalists, into the fold. Yes, th there was a mm -hmm. rupture, mm -hmm. but it turned out that uh, Lucien Bouchard, the uh, minister who left and founded the Bloc Québécois, reconciled with Mr. Maloney over right. the last eight months. Mm -hmm. So he, they were uh, celebrating their friendship again uh, uh, until he passed away. And Monsieur Bouchard was uh, uh, talking about this last night on openly on, on the networks in French. And it was a very touching moment to see Lucien Bouchard recognizing that Monsieur Maloney was, uh, he called him, a big monument in, mm -hmm. in, in, in Quebec. Well, you know, I want to talk about that because, you know, he, he did pursue these big ideas. And certainly in this country, one of the biggest, one of the hardest uh, obstacles is to, to finally get Quebec's signature on the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that certainly is what Brown Rooney yeah. has tried to do with Meech Lake. How did Mulroney change the, the dialogue around the Constitution uh, in Quebec? And what type of legacy is that leave behind? There are some wounds still, I think, but we're slowly turning the page in Quebec, and I think that's a good thing. And because after the uh, failure of Meech Lake, most of the things that were included in Meech Lake got, you know, <laughs> brought up by uh, the Chrétien government. Mm -hmm. The Distinct Society Clause was was adopted, and, and most of what and was in Meech Lake. stuff? Exactly. Uh, the fact that uh, Quebec is now consulted for mm -hmm. the nomination of the Supreme Court, so most of it is done. Um, so, uh, and we've seen a more, uh, I would say, constitutional peace as a result of it because as time passed away, uh, I think, but his legacy will remain as a prime minister who tried to reconcile Quebec and the rest of the country, and that's a huge legacy. Uh, everybody was celebrating that yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had the, I mean, I know, Bob, you talked to him quite a bit, so I talked to him in late November, because I'm kind of noodling away on a book on scrums and uh, asking them about his relationship when he was prime minister with reporters and so on. Uh, but one of the things that was a kind of a sidebar, but he wanted to set the record straight on a lot of things. You know how he, he'll answer a question, then he'll say, and by the way, um, <laughs> and he was talking about um, Meech Lake and the failure of it. and. Uh, and then, lo and behold, he says, yeah, fine, I was a conservative prime minister, and uh, uh, Pierre Trudeau was against Meech Lake. But then, sure enough, in 1995, when the referendum happened, and it looks like it's going to be lost, it was fine for Jean Chrétien to go give a speech 
in, I think it was Verdun, yep. Quebec, mm -hmm. talking about distinct society, we're going to do that for you. So he was kind of, he sounded a little bit bitter about that, you know, that, uh, that he went through hell trying to get Mich Lake through, and it never passed. He lost friendships with Lucien Bouchard, the Bloc Québécois was formed, and then just he a few the years, a few yeah. years, yeah, a few years later, then it's, the, the words at least are spoken by Jean Chrétien, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, I'm quickly running out of time, so I'm going to uh, fast forward to final thoughts here, and I'll go around the table. Because, as we noted, uh, Mr. Mulroney had a love, not love so much, the media <laughs> moments. I'm uh, wondering, uh, beyond what you already shared, Bob, any story that you want to share with people well, right well, now? Well, you know, uh, he was obsessed with the media. <laughs> he, cl he claimed that he never read um, news reports or watched TV, which wasn't true. Uh, uh, one of his press secretaries, Michel Graton, wrote a book, So What Are the Boys Saying? Uh, he wanted to know what we were doing. He wanted, he read everything, and you knew when you wrote something bad, he wouldn't look at you. You know, he'd walk back. <laughs> but, if he, but if he liked the, he liked the story, hello, Michael, how are you? <laughs> oh, I love it. And Julie? Well, um, you know, I just think that uh, as the years go on, when he was looking back, and, and I'm sorry, but this is like a 10-second thing, because I was asking him about his relationship with the media, and, you know, he, he was always uh, criticized for his Gucci shoes and being too slick and all this stuff. And the media had a real thing on with them where a lot of times they did not get along. And I asked him about that. And he said, if you're going to be prime minister, you've got to have two things, a sense of humor and a sense of history. I had a feeling, given that what we had done on Meech Lake Accord, free trade, NAFTA, Nelson Mandela, the Acid Rain Treaty, growing the relationship with Washington, these were big ticket items. I had the sense that while we weren't going to get any credit then, history would look after us. So That's he true. kind of always had his eye on, okay, yeah. I'm not going to get a, like, these are not my friends. <laughs> they are not my friends. I thought they were my friends. They're not. But as history goes forward, maybe looking back, people will see what I accomplished. Well, and without a doubt, in the last uh, 24 hours since, since this news has been known, those are exactly what people are commenting on, remembering mm -hmm. of Brian Mulroney. Uh, to, Quick to, to, personal just, story yeah. on my part. I was a page in the House of Commons, so I brought a glass of water to Mr. Mulroney <laughs> and some messages from cabinet ministers to him. So, And when I was a page, I was studying at Carlton. You wanted to be a journalist? wanted to cover hockey, <laughs> Can Montreal Canadiens. But after watching what Mr. M Maloney had done and the transformative leader that he was, I said, I'm going to cover another sports, politics. <laughs> <laughs> so I could tell Mr. Maloney with the way, he, the, what, what he brought, because when I was a page, but, uh, Ronald Reagan came and gave a speech in the House of Commons, followed by François Mitterrand. Michelet mm. was signed. There was a oh, vote wow. on capital punishment, on a motion that was rejected to revive or reestablish capital punishment. Mm. Those were big moments in history for a kid of 18 year old to watch. Mm. And mm. I said, if I can watch it like this, I'd like to write about it one day. So. I decided I wanted to be on the hill, and I've been on the hill since 1994. Oh, Way better a than a hockey story. game. A great totally. story. <laughs> yeah, you know, the sends are better anyways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, Julie, Joe, Denis, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Nice being thank here. Thank you. We have been hearing from many of the people who knew Brian Mulroney. And something that's been remarked upon more than once uh, were his skills as a conciliator. He mentored many politicians from different political parties and really had a talent to bridge the partisan gap. You heard it right here during our political panel. And that is something Canada's current Prime Minister Justin Trudeau also touched upon on Thursday when news of Mulroney's death first broke. He was uh, incredibly generous and effective in advising me and our government on the renegotiation, renegotiation of NAFTA uh, during some very challenging years uh, where not just the advice and strategic counsel he gave me and us, but also active with uh, his contacts as part of Team Canada to make sure that the messages on how important the friendship and the relationship between Canada and the U.S. was, not just for Canada, but the U.S., was key. 
Well, as we continue to remember Brian Mulroney, we are happy to welcome on the program today, Perrin Beattie. These days, the president and the CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, but of course he held several portfolios in the Mulroney government, including Minister of National Revenue, Minister of Health, and Solicitor General of Canada. Mr. Beattie, always good to see you. Thanks for having me. Listen, I want to begin here with the, the message on social media that you sent out uh, in the, the wake of the announcement of Mr. Mulroney's death. And in this uh, post, you write, under Brian Mulroney's leadership, Canada became more confident, more prosperous, and more respected in the world. I will always be grateful to have known him and to have had the privilege of serving with him. You know, I, I want to begin in particular with that first part, when you say that Canada became more confident under Brian Mulroney. How? There was a sense that we could contribute to solving problems both in Canada and around the world as well. And you could see uh, with the relationships that he built with other world leaders, for example, that Canada was seen as a strategic partner and that Canada's advice, our counsel, our voice was welcomed in international meetings and, and we were listened to. It, it made a real difference made a real difference as you say I, but you know I do wonder about uh, your relationship with with Mr. Mulroney in particular your first impressions of him because uh, you are younger than Mr. Mulroney was but you were elected before him right out of university you were also in Joe Clark's cabinet what did you think of Mr. Mulroney in those early years I had actually worked very hard against Brian Mulroney I'd supported Joe Clark at the leadership convention in 1984 and I expected that I was going to be sent into exile, that I'd be in Siberia somewhere and that, that I might not have a political future. He did exactly the opposite. What he did was to reach out to people who hadn't supported him, and he brought us in to, to the center. And I mentioned it to him one day and said, you know, I found it truly extraordinary that, that you reached out and that you've treated me the way that you have. And he said, as far as I was concerned, the day that the convention was over, we turned a page and we're all part of the same team. When somebody does something like that, it builds such a sense of, of loyalty and, and commitment that it's really remarkable. And so, as your previous pan panel was saying, the relationship he had with caucus was so incredibly strong that even when, when we were down to you know 10% in the polls, members of caucus would have crawled over broken glass to support him in any way that they could. It was an extraordinary manager of people, and the relationships that he built were was were just amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I, how did that change your own life? I, I wonder, though, because you know, as you said, he reached out to someone who is in the the government before him, Joe Clark, who he, he succeeds as, as conservative leader, uh, and then not only brings you into the inner circle, but trusts you, this you know young gun, to play major roles in his government. How did that change your life? Well, it taught me a lot about leadership. I was still a pretty, you know, I was pretty young at the time. And uh, I had not had, I'd had nine months of experience in Joe Clark's cabinet as a, as a cabinet minister. So barely had a chance to find out where the office was before the government was defeated. Uh, he was bringing me in, tr entrusting heavy responsibilities to me. And it taught me a great deal about, about how you should manage people. Uh, this was perhaps the last time that there was truly cabinet government, where essentially the marching orders we had, where uh, you know what the government's policies are, stick with government's policies, don't you know, don't trip and fall to make a, create problems in your department, and lead, run your department. Uh, and there was that real sense that that we weren't simply under the thumb of, of centralized leadership from the prime minister's office. It it really truly was a collegial government, but it was the prime minister's vision for the country and his sense of direction, the loyalty that he developed with everybody that that moved all of this forward. And it was truly extraordinary. It it reminds us about the importance of our political leaders should be running for office not because they simply want to hold the office but because of what they want to do with the office. And you had in Brian Mulroney somebody who had a clear vision of what he thought that Canada could be if we did the right things. And he was prepared to spend political capital and to accept all sorts of opprobrium to move the country ahead in that direction. And we, we are reaping the benefits of that years and years later. Mm -hmm. uh, as we reflect on uh, Mr. Mulroney, I, I, I do wonder what you hope Canadians will remember of him, what you believe they should know about Brian Mulroney as someone who worked so closely with him? First, that he was a transformational leader, that he was visionary, he was principled, and, and that he 
was, was determined to be there to make a change, and he made that change for, for the better. Secondly, that he demonstrated that Canada could have a strong, clear, respected voice on the international stage. Third, that it was pro possible to, to solve problems if governments were prepared to lead and to apply themselves. And that it is, and that I, I think the other thing is is the sense of decency that that we need to restore civility in Canadian politics again, where it's possible to disagree with somebody but not to hate them, and to understand the difference between being an opponent and being an enemy, or that somebody sitting across uh, sit, sitting across from you could be wrong without being evil. We need to, to restore a civil dialogue again, and the friendships that he developed and the support that he gave to people of all political backgrounds were, were was really remarkable. Perrin Beatty, as I say, I always appreciate the time you have for us. Thank you for this. Thank you for having me. As we end this special edition of Primetime Politics, we thought it would be appropriate to hear from Brian Mulroney one last time. And as his friends and former colleagues shared, he was a man who pursued big ideas. As a result, he had both successes and failures, something Brian Mulroney addressed back in 2013. Uh, had, a, had a good run at it. I was their prime minister for almost nine years. Um, I had, I had the time to do, um, we had some successes and we had some failures. That's life. Yeah. And I have no regrets. Um, I think that the government and our activities, uh, where we did a lot of big things internationally and domestically, uh, are, we look a little better in hindsight as the time goes on. And um, we did our best for mm -hmm. Canada. And I'm happy with that. I have no desire or no interest at all in anything that's really going on in that, in that nature. Brian Mulroney in conversation with Catherine Clark. I'm Michael Serapio. CPAC will have live coverage of Brian Mulroney's state funeral when it happens. Until then, for everyone here at CPAC and on Primetime Politics, thank you for watching.